Okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully in the right spot. This is computer safety slash security for beginners. Uh, the reason that we introduced this class, so we've been doing a lot of stuff with the Google Apps. You've probably seen a lot of those things on the calendar. But we decided to do this because we feel that safety and security when using a computer, especially with everything going on in the internet today, so many customers that we do work with are always asking us questions about this, concerns and viruses and phishing emails and spam. How do I make sense of all of it? So this is really the reason why we decided to make a class for beginners and also we're gonna do a little bit higher level, intermediate level class um, for people. So uh, we really wanna answer all those questions, get past all those myths that people have. You know, what is a virus? What is a piece of malware? What's spyware? Um, all these different things. So you can use your computer, uh, you know, at least having a safe sense that you know what you're doing and you know that um, you're, not, you're not going into the unknown territory um, and getting infected and you know, all the other nice things that come along with computer usage <laughs> today. Um, Ruth gave us a, light, a small introduction, I, I do appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm Derek Lodars, I am the president and founder of uh, our company FireLogic. We are a Park Ridge based uh, technology consulting company. We do uh, home and office uh, computer repair, consulting, uh, but we do a lot more. We do a lot of training now. Uh, we just got back from DC two weeks ago. We did a large Google Apps training for a lot of technicians out there. So we are all over the place now. Um, business is, is definitely expanding. Um, <clears throat> Wesley Howard, he's my lead web developer on the team, but he also helps me out with uh, a lot of the security and, and home and office uh, computer repairs. Um, he that primarily does all of our website work. Um, <clears throat> both of us are certified in a few different things. Uh, we're both uh, Google Apps certified trainer. Uh, Wesley has a certification for deploying Google Apps um, on his side, and I also have a, a certification from CompTIA in Security Plus, which means that I can go out and consult people on the uh, proper ways to handle computer security, security for their offices and businesses and things like that. Okay. So the agenda for today, very short and simple. Uh, when we do our Google classes, they're a lot more fully fleshed out, but today most of the info we're gonna talk about in person. Uh, so that's why I didn't make the agenda as long as, as usual. Uh, but just a, a few short ways uh, a few short topics for today. Uh, we're going to start off with a quick video that I think is very interesting and will really open your eyes as to where we are with um, using the internet and your computer today. So I just want to show everyone a quick clip from that. Um, I'm going to ask everyone uh, uh, what scares you, what questions you have initially, what you know are the major topics on your mind. You know, as much as we came to this class with topics we want to cover, we want to know what concerns you. Or is this something that you want to know in specific so we can make sure that we address all of the things that you want to know about. Um, Wes is going to take over then. He's going to handle some of the major topics uh, in terms of security and safety online. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and answer any things that we didn't uh, prep in for our presentation. And then we'll open up a open Q&A for any final questions or anything else that people are curious about. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So here's a little cartoon. We like to throw cartoons in our presentations sometimes. So um, here we have a little uh, we have computer user. And then uh, he's saying, if someone stole my social security number off the internet and stole my identity, thank God I hate being me. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's the way I would see uh, someone taking my social security number, but there's our joke for the day. Lighten the mood a little bit. Okay, I'm going to play a little video here. Um, and we're going to start at a minute 30. This is a clip from 60 Minutes, uh, the news program. Um, and they were doing an interview here with you know, one of the um, higher ups from Symantec. Symantec is a large computer security company. Um, that makes antivirus software, a lot of corporate solutions. Um, so uh, just open everyone's eyes a little bit. I'll play the video without further ado. A sleeper cell. Imagine a network of spies. The bad guys who created it haven't triggered Configure. It's just sitting out there like... The basis of the discussion here was about Configure. This was a big worm uh, piece of malware that came out a few years back. So this, this wasn't very, very recent, this interview, but all the concepts they talk about and things that are shown in this video are very, very relevant still. The sleeper cell. Imagine a network of spies. 
that has infiltrated a country, and every day all of the spies are calling in for their instructions on what to do next. What's the worm being asked to do? That's the interesting thing. The only thing the worm is being asked to do is to ask for further instructions. So we're talking several months. That's right. Several months, it's just been sitting there. That's exactly right. I don't know, I'm hearing Jaws music. It's that ominous, because once the hackers issue instructions, Conficker could turn menacing in an instant. With one click, the worm's creator can instruct it to suck sensitive data, like bank passwords and account numbers, out of millions of computers, or launch a massive spam attack to clog up the works. The newest targets of worms are social networking sites. Trilling showed us how it might work. So is this a real Facebook page? This is a real Facebook page. Oh, okay. And okay. we added your friend and colleague, Morley Safer. You can see down there in the left. He says a worm can crack into a Facebook account like Morley's and send a message to anyone on his friends list. We have a message from Morley. A message I'm sure to open since it comes from a trusted friend. Click there. It says, ha, 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 check Check out this hilarious video of you. That's right. So well, I would do that. I took the bait, and by clicking on the video link... Oh, something looks a little off. Very off. Am I already infected just by that? You're already infected. That quickly? That quickly. As Trilling demonstrated on a second screen, the hacker owned me. From here on out, as we'll see, everything you do is going to show up on the hacker's machine. So when I typed my username and password into a bank website... It appeared instantly on the hacker screen, along with my bank account details. Everything I, I type shows up here. Every single keystroke you hit. In fact, if you make a mistake and hit a backspace, that shows up in the window. The hacker then followed me around as I browsed the Internet from CBS News. <gasps> Take a look at what oh the hacker said. Exactly where you are. To Amazon.com. So if I buy something, they're going to have my credit card? Everything you type in, your address, your credit card, it's all sure. going to show up in that window. The Internet has become a minefield. Hackers have hidden their malicious software, known as malware, on some of the most trusted websites, like eBay, the Miami Dolphins football team, even MyBarackObama.com. Trilling says too few people have top-notch, up-to-date security software. There is something that would have prevented me from... So that's the clip I wanted to show. This is an example. This is just one of many of the millions and millions of viruses that are out there. These are the kinds of things that they're doing. And again, this is more reason why we felt it was so important to have a class like this so that you don't become one of these victims. Because this does happen to people on a daily basis, just from normal internet usage but from doing things like opening spam emails, phishing emails, going to links like they did on Facebook pages that look too good to be true. So these are some of the things that Wesley, when he comes up, he's going to talk about how to keep yourself protected so this kind of a thing does not hit your computer. Okay? And I, and I don't show this to scare everyone, but this is the reality. It, it is scary, but this is the reality of, of what's going on. This is why... When, when you ask why do virus writers, why do hackers write these kind of programs to infect our machines, it's because they're making money off of it. That is what's going on here. It's an economic thing. If it wasn't economic, they wouldn't be doing it. <clears throat> so I guess I'll throw the question out to everyone. What scares everyone uh, about internet security? What do you feel least comfortable about uh, when it comes to using your computer or using the internet? Yes. Someone's going to get the password and have access. Okay. Anyone else? Spyware built into antivirus and malware programs. B built in? Yes. Such as, uh, you, have, you have experienced this? Uh, I have, but a colleague of mine did. He went a legitimate it. program? Yeah, and somehow the hacker found a way to put it in piggy bank. Huh. And it, it was a legitimate, I think what it was, he bought a version of... Uh, E9 or something like that. It's a French one. Okay. Off the internet. Okay. And there's a few of them you can buy. are supposed to be free. Mm -hmm. And he found out his one of his bank accounts got cleaned out. Really? So mm -hmm. he had one computer and he goes only to his bank account with it. And he had a legitimate 
antivirus program on there, and it, it had a spyware in. I'd really be curious if he didn't get caught with one of those links like we saw, those links that were infected that might have looked like it was to purchase legitimate, because they are very good, and Wes is going to show this later, they are very good at making fake things look like legitimate programs, yeah, legitimate websites. Yeah. But he had done it on two or three other computers. And this guy was fairly computer savvy. Hmm. He was showing me how to put Ubuntu on a sure, computer. Sure. I don't remember what he told me because I lost the paper. But he, that's one of the things that bugs me is finding out there's spyware on your antivirus programs. And it's like, oh. I, I, I'm going to say that's probably the exception, not the rule, because I personally have not run into that in okay. the many years I've been doing this. I'm glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe Wes is in a different position, but I've, I've never seen that before. I, I think that we're going to cover an example of what happened to, uh, to him, okay. just to give a little better um, coverage on it. But we are going to cover that. The, the other thing that scares me is having to buy a new computer because some of these viruses are so bad. One of my mm -hmm. colleagues at work. She was, there's a apparently there's a loophole in the law that says you're allowed to go to 15 different websites and download a section of a movie, and then go to another another section of a movie. So you can end up with a free movie okay. as long as you. Well, this virus was so bad. She took it over to Best Buy and they started looking at it. They were ripping cords out of it. Um, it was, yeah. Let me put a huge word of advice, and I, I have a bias in saying this um, because we are an IT yeah. company. Don't do but that like that having worked for Geek Squad for about six months and then quitting, uh, don't ever take your computer to Best Buy. They are a bunch of high school kids. None of them are certified. They have no idea what they're doing. Oh, okay. That's good to know. <laughs> but well, what I was saying is once they got done, one of my biggest fears is having to either A, find a safe place to get recovery CDs from because mm -hmm. they no longer give them with the computer. Mm -hmm. You can get an internet, you can get a virus just logging on to the internet. Yeah, that's true. I, now I've got spyware, malware, whatever kind of wear mm -hmm. on my recovery CDs that I supposedly downloaded. And it's like, now what do I that, and then Well, again, it's all about where you're getting, what sources you're using to get these things uh, from. Like Microsoft. Or no, you don't have to go to any particular, just get on the internet. You can have a virus. Right? Well, I understand that. But I'm saying if you're getting recovery disks, are you getting from a trusted source? There are many yes, non trusted yes, sources yes. that are giving out disks that are supposedly clean copies um, of Microsoft software that are truly legitimate, have viruses built into them. I run into them probably uh, every few months, so oh, they do yeah. exist. <laughs> um, you, if you're downloading a recovery CD, it has to be from a Microsoft website. There really is no other source for the recovery disk. Right. Uh, sometimes each individual OEM or um, manufacturer such as Gateway or Dell or HP will put out their own uh, CD that you can download from their website, uh, especially if it doesn't come with your computer. But to get the original OEM copy of Windows, you have to go to Microsoft. Okay, I'm willing to do that. But what do you do if going to the website, somehow you get these products, you don't even know where it came from. Um, and now you've got this virus in your recovery CD. That, okay. The only thing you can do now is replace the computer. Could, could we could we cover that a little bit later okay. in the Q and A? Just because I want to I want to keep keep sure. everything moving. Uh, did someone else raise their hand? I saw him. Yes. Um, what concerns me is that what uh, someone told me that you know once you put something out there, you just can't ever get back, and that just freaks me out. To a certain extent, and maybe Wes is a little more of an authority on, on, um, on this it, than myself. It's if you true. If you put a photo on Facebook and then delete it, uh, as long as you have the URL for that image, you can still get to it. Facebook does not delete pictures, even if you ask them to. As long as you have what? The uh, address for the image. And that's true with not just Facebook. That's true with most of what you put on the web. Um, you know, most websites, as soon as they go up, they're all archived on multiple different, uh, what's called like internet museums, where they take copies of all the websites in the world and they keep a history of it. Uh, the Wayback Machine is one example of it, where you can go back and see what a website looked like back in 95 or 98. Um, so things like that keep copies. Google has its own system called the Google Cache that keeps a uh, temporary copy, I think, for a few months of a website. So even if a website goes down, they keep a copy of it on their system. So to a certain extent, yes, that does exist, as Wesley said on Facebook, for generally putting something out on the regular internet. Um, yes, I mean, you have to be careful of what you put out there. Don't think that 
anything is private, um, you know, out on the internet. If it's in, di I'll tell you this: if it's in digital form, it can probably be copied and put somewhere else. And just be careful what you put online. I mean, if it's on your computer, there's a good chance it's safe. Mm -hmm. If you put it, you know, on a social media website or you know somewhere on a forum post, it's private. I mean, it's public now. It's no longer in your control. Um, the exception um, are these cloud storage solutions. Um, if you upload something to the cl a cloud site, say Google Drive or uh, Dropbox, your files still are in your control and that provider isn't allowed to take that information. So the cloud yes. is safe? That was my yes. question. Yeah, legitimate cloud storage places. Google Drive is our top pick for a safe place to put files like that. Dropbox, SugarSync, um, Crash Plan, all these other services that um, store your files in a secure manner, those are legitimate. But placing something onto a public website like Twitter or Facebook, even though you think it might be locked down, eh, people can still get to it. So I wouldn't consider you know, social networks to be as safe as we think them, uh, that they are. And here's the thing, if Google can get to your individual picture on a site and index it, your image is instantly in Google's image directory, so if you do an image search for that image, there's a good chance you can find it. I mean, and that's not going anywhere, because like I said, if that's on a Facebook page and you delete the original image, Google still has a copy of it, it's not going anywhere, because Facebook has not removed that link. Yes? So like if we transfer um, our photos from the camera to the computer, mm -hmm and then delete a few of those, those ones we deleted are still accessible to somebody? No. If it's on your machine that's never touched the internet, then it's it's in your full control. So no, those aren't public. And so when If you put those on Facebook and delete them off Facebook, there's a possibility that it was, still could access them. Okay. That's the difference. Is it on your machine? Or is there, isn't it a locked cloud storage service? Or is it on Facebook, Twitter, the general open internet? No. That's the difference. Okay. Yeah, but it's on your machine. As long as you haven't given anyone access to the machine, it's still private. And then if I delete those off of my machine to the they're trash gone. or whatever, yeah. they're gone. They're gone. Okay. Yes. So, what are, where's the email in this? Is it on my machine or? Is it not on the email for most people still is uh, stored online. We can; those are considered secure cloud storage spaces. Um, the only time where it becomes insecure is when you use a program like Outlook or Thunderbird to download your mail to your computer or you're downloading mail to your iPad or your, or your Mac. That's where you're pulling copies of the messages down and if a virus gets on your machine and happens to be a piece of malware virus that wants to sift through emails and find email addresses and this happens because uh, sometimes you'll see someone, one of your friends that will send out a blast message with a link to some goofy website saying, hey, click on this link, sort of what we saw up in that video. Um, that happens a lot to email, where the, someone spammer will then send out a message to everyone of all your addresses that were from your, your actual email program on your computer. So th that is one of the gray areas where possibly, yes, it could, could become public. Uh, that's why we recommend people just to keep their email in their, in their Gmail or in their Yahoo Mail or in their AT&T email or Comcast email. Don't pull your email down to your computer uh, through a program like that. And we're going to go over all this in a little more detail in a couple of minutes, but we'll make sure to cover all your questions. Okay. All right, I just wanted to put a few numbers together um, to show everyone where we stand in terms of general security and safety on the internet today. Um, in terms of email, as you can see, it's pretty grim. 75% of all emails sent in the last year was spam. <laughs> so three quarters of all messages that are being sent out are junk mail uh, messages. But it's actually better because in 2010, I think it was around 85, 86%. So we are getting better. We are, really, we are getting better. A lot of the big spammers are being shut down. Um, all the email systems are getting better filtering security, filtering software. So this is not, it looks grim, but it, we are getting better uh, compared to where we were. I think it was in the 90s back in like 2008, 2009. So this number is coming down, but still, most of all email is not even legitimate email anymore. Uh, one of every 299 emails sent out is a phishing message, a message looking for passwords, social security numbers, credit card numbers, trying to get you to buy something to steal information or to steal your credit card number. So, um, when we, we'll, Wes is going to cover what those are in, a little bit later as, as well. Uh, and one of every 239 emails sent out has a virus attached to it. 
That also has gotten better because uh, most email programs are pretty good at filtering that. A lot of people are installing better security software on their computer, so it's not as much of an issue. And again, when you're viewing email on the websites of Comcast, AT&T, Yahoo, uh, Gmail, they are filtering out those viruses right away. But when you download those messages, that's where you open yourself uh, up to uh, any viruses that are on those email messages. Uh, mobile phones, smartphones, we thought that those were in, uh, uh, weren't vulnerable, but look at this. In 2011, we had a 93% increase in mobile attacks. So attacks meant directly for Blackberries, iPhones, Android phones. So these aren't you know, going to escape the, the wrath of viruses and malware. These, this will become a larger concern. And while this isn't a very large number compared to how many viruses are floating around the internet, this is only going to get worse as everyone relies more on their smartphones. Um, one thing I want to say, um, unless you're using uh, added Bluetooth accessories on your phones, if you have an Android phone or uh, an iPhone, turn Bluetooth off. Don't walk around with Bluetooth because there yeah, are very good a ton suggestion. of viruses for Bluetooth. Yeah, what goes on in Bluetooth? The Bluetooth is a technology that makes it very easy for us to use little little headsets that the all the people that look like Secret Service agents wearing their uh, um, in their ears, uh, things like that, things like other accessories we connect to our phones. But the downside is that that technology has made it very easy for people to walk by you and spread a virus just by passing you down the street. So again, keep Bluetooth off unless you're using it. You don't know what's going to be passed along by using that uh, that technology. So turn it off if you're using it in your car because you have a wireless. Bluetooth. That's fine. Turn it on. That's fine. And then turn it off. Don't go to the United Center and leave Bluetooth on if you're not using it for anything. Mm -hmm. That's very dangerous. Okay. Um, you, malicious web domains. These are websites specifically made just to pass around viruses. Take a look at this. 2010, we had 42,000 of these. In 2011, we had 55,000. That's a 29% increase in malicious uh, malicious websites uh, that are out on the internet. Uh, these are things that we go to, we do Google searches, and we click on a website that looks like it's got information that we want to learn about. Actually, it's a malicious website. So we have to be careful with where we're going online. This is something that's very tough to control because anyone that has a credit card number can purchase both a website address and to put up a website that contains whatever they want it to contain. Google is not the authority to tell everyone in the world to take their website down. That's what people ask me. Well, why can't Google do something about it? They are trying to do something about it, but imagine how many of these websites that they have to worry about and they're coming out on a daily basis. So Google, Google just can't keep up with taking these links down off of their search results. So we have to be mindful, unless we'll go over this, of how to watch out for these things, be mindful of where we're going online. Just because Google shows it doesn't mean it's a legitimate place. Not by any means. Uh, and if you're using a Mac, you aren't alone. Every three out of 100 Macs that are out in the wild have some sort of a virus on there. And knowing that most Mac users uh, you know, take an approach of, I don't need any kind of security on my machine, they are more likely spreading those viruses as well uh, to other systems. So 3% of all Macs uh, do have viruses on them uh, today. Uh, and this is uh, a quote from Eugene Kaspersky. He is the founder of Kaspersky Antivirus, a, one of the trusted names in security software. Uh, he said recently that cyber criminals have now recognized that the Mac is an interesting area. Welcome to Microsoft's world, Mac. It's full of malware. This is very true. This number here is only going to get larger uh, as the years go on. So uh, we definitely, and we must, we will go over why it's very important to get a good, good antivirus uh, solution for your computer and not to be browsing the internet with no security because as you said, yes, it's very easy to go onto Google or go on the web and get a virus just like that. It is very quick. These viruses are pinging systems around the world on a very on a second by second basis. And if you are going online without antivirus software, you are potentially being touched by all those different uh, viruses that are floating around. Uh, and here's just one last number. Um, one in six PCs today still have no security protection out there. So. Um, not good, and that's well, part of the reason why we are doing this awareness class to make sure everyone knows um, how to be using the internet uh, in a safe manner. Are some of these numbers shocking to anyone, or is this sort of what you were expecting? Is this open everyone's eyes, hopefully, it's a little worse. bit more than, than that worse. video? What was that? It's worse, worse than, than what I thought. Yeah. I, I thought it was bad, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially when, when we see that 75% of all email uh, out there is spam. 
Uh, but again, this is why that you know we recommend good email services. Uh, you know, starts off with having a provider that does a good job with filtering out your email. Google's free Gmail service. If you're on a service, you know, some kind of off the wall email uh, system uh, that doesn't have a good filtering program, you can get a free email account from Google's Gmail. They have probably the best spam filter uh, in the world. Uh, that blocks the majority of spam. I get hit with about 500 to 600 spam e emails a day. I might see two, three reach my inbox in a month. So they are very, very good at filtering out those messages. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to go over some of the um, some of the basic terms uh, that are out there. Uh, I know we listen to the. Uh, TV, we listen to radio, everyone's throwing around these different terms for all the different things out there, trying to get you to buy things. Uh, so we're going to set straight what all these different things mean. Um, starting off with kinds of pieces of malware. So when we say, when I say malware, malware is the term that we've come up with to encompass all this junk. Because it used to be back in the like mid-90s that viruses were the only thing we had to worry about. But then the 2000, year 2000 came around, and then worms and trojans started to come out, and then around 2004, 2005, rootkits started to come out. So, so the, the amount of things have just been ballooning. Uh, I will say that viruses make up a very small portion of the different types of malware that are out there today. The majority of what's on people's machines these days are rootkits and uh, worms. These are the most common things that we're seeing in people's systems. And these carry with them, uh, something we'll show in a little bit, they carry adware and spyware with them. You've probably heard of that term. That's the software that pops up and it looks like a legitimate antivirus program as you touched on, uh, but it's not. And it, and it looks so real. We'll show a screenshot of it. It looks very real um, and you think it's a legitimate program, but it's asking you to pl plug in a credit card number or your computer's gonna explode. And again, this is where sort of intuition comes in. You say, something's not right here. And that's what these programs plan. They plan emotion because that is the best form of getting their junkware on your computer, making you feel scared, making you feel helpless in order to get their program, in order to get a credit card number from you, a social security number from you. They plan emotion. They plan a thing called social engineering. I'm going to let Wes take over. This is uh, uh, his, uh, his area that he's going to uh, cover with everyone. Um, but I'll still be around answering any questions as the, the class moves, up, moves forward. Um, as Derek had mentioned, a lot of these infections do rely on you actually taking action to deploy them. This is a little thing called social engineering, as Derek had brought up. And what this is, is they try to get into your head. They try to get you to do things that are going to install malicious software. Um, they'll play on the fact that a given friend might send you a message or uh, send you a picture. Here's the thing, if you receive an individual picture in an email, that picture can actually have a virus in it. Um, a couple of years back, um, I downloaded a picture from a friend of mine and he later on sent me a response about two hours later, don't download that, it corrupted all my photos. Um, sure enough, a few days later, all my photos have new extensions aren't working properly, they're all infected, um, and my antivirus's only solution was to delete them all. Um, I actually ended up going through manually removing the virus from every image, 8,000 of them, um, because there wasn't a single cure that the antiviruses could do. You know, all it was was a piece of code appended to the end of it. But once again, this was several years back, and now viruses have become much more uh, difficult to remove. So in the event that a virus does attach itself onto one of your files, there's a good chance that, that file can't be recovered. Um, now, uh, Derek, how far down the list did we get? Um, I just I just introduced uh, viruses and uh, right. viruses and worms, root kids. All right. Um, all right. Um, a basic virus um, kind of covers the general idea of what most people think a virus is. Um, the issue with the term virus is that it's been kind of overused. Um, I, I told everyone that malware is the new general yeah. term that encompasses everything. Now, the thing with viruses, we still have viruses per se, but they're not as prevalent as they used to. Malware is a much bigger problem nowadays. Now, a virus, you know, what it does is it infects an individual file rather than a system. Malware 
would be more focused on uh, attacking your system as a whole and gaining control. Um, what the virus does is it infects an individual file and what this will do is once that file is open, the virus will be triggered and the effect of that virus will then be deployed on your system. Um, this might be that it goes and attacks other files on your system that deletes files from your hard drive or corrupts your computer in some way. Um, that is the general 90s uh, definition of what a virus is. It doesn't really cover 90% of what we really get today. It just has become such a fundamental term in security that we continue to call our software antivirus software. Um, but now a lot of companies are moving to calling their uh, software security software as opposed to virus software. And part of the reason this change happens, and you may be asking, well, what happened? Why did viruses not become as popular? Or why did their popularity drop? It's because back when, back in the 90s and early 2000s, all these hackers were doing this as a game, as a competition amongst one another. Now it's more of an economic benefit. So now that they can make lots of money off of doing this to people's computers, that's why we see the prevalence of spyware, adware, all the things where credit card numbers are coming into play. So that's where that change happened was in the early 2000s. The other thing is with the virus, um, it actually has to be physically transferred to your PC. So it would be stored on a physical media, say a jump drive or a floppy disk or a CD-ROM. I say floppy disk because this was an era that this was really prevalent. You really don't see this anymore. There's a couple of viruses. I've seen viruses written recently. They're nowhere near what these malware programs can do. Um, the next one is a worm. Um, this is slightly more advanced. Uh, this is kind of moving out of the realm of virus. This is somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, a malware attack, what this, I mean, a warm attack. Uh, what this does is it gets into your system and its only intention is to spread. Um, what it'll do is um, it'll spread to all the other files in your system that it intends to infect. And it'll check your network for open volumes and it'll infect those. And what it tries to do is and it's very similar to a virus, just that it's really intent in multiplying itself, replicating. The video that we watched from uh, uh, from 60 Minutes, that was uh, called the Configure Worm. That was a program that goes machine to machine to machine, it just hops uh, onto multiple different systems at a very fast pace. Uh, and in that example, it was meant to go onto millions of PCs uh, in a very short time period. I mean, the focus of the worm spread rapidly before you get detected. Because once the security companies detect it, the chance of infection decreases. But the scary realization is that uh, I can guarantee you that right now, probably one in three of you in this room are using Windows Defender. Um, that was the statistic I looked up. Um, this is an antivirus that's supplied by Windows by default. Um, even if you have other AV software installed, there's a good chance you do have this program. Um, it does the job of getting basic things, but the problem is it's maintained by Microsoft, and Microsoft has its hands full trying to keep it up to date. It's usually about three months backlogged. So new viruses that come out won't be detected for another three months. Are you saying Windows Defender is actually a legitimate program? Windows Defender is indeed a legitimate program. It is uh, released by Microsoft. Uh, there are copies of it that are malicious. That and Wes is going to show off how, how one of those looks. They, they, again, they change the name a little bit. They make it look legitimate, but it's not the real product. Yeah. Just tell me about it. It looks very, 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 very real. No, there's uh, several fake versions of Windows Defender because it is such a prevalent piece of software, and people trust the Microsoft brand. And it's probably one of the primary reasons that so many people still have Windows PCs even though they are the primary uh, targeted hackers. Um, I am going to say though, Macs aren't safe. If you have an iPhone, a MacBook, you can still get a virus. It's just, it's less likely because it's not really being targeted at. Windows is installed on about 80% of all PCs and it just is really a prevalent piece of um, software so the hackers go after it. Um, you know, I, let me rephrase that. Um, the people that, um, this hacker term, that's technically incorrect. It's usually a cracker or um, sort of, the term hacker is actually originally meant to uh, intend to be somebody that builds something or develops the internet as a whole. Um, by definition, I am a hacker. Um, by definition, the people that try to steal your information are crackers. 
Uh, they don't intend to build anything. They intend to steal and destroy your information. Um, they're malicious. Um, whereas that, it's just it's a commonplace term because hacker has become a very popular term, and that's what the media goes with. So what the media goes with becomes the status quo. Um, in the uh, IT community, um, we do use Cracker and Hacker interchangeably, but that's more of a force of habit based on public perception. Um, so, the next one. Oops, actually isn't working. All right, uh, email viruses. Um, what email viruses do is they get into your actual uh, email account. Like Dirk said, if you have Outlook or Thunderbird or any other email client on your PC, and an individual virus is written to take advantage of your piece of software that you're using for your email, uh, what it will do is it will go through your entire address book, look up every friend you have, and send out a mass message with a copy of itself embedded in it. Now, this uh, individual email message may contain a worm, a piece of malware, some other virus, but the fact of the matter is, once it gets into your system, its purpose is to act quickly uh, and spread itself across your a list of contacted friends. And the reason it does this is because the individual hacker already knows that all those emails are legitimate. They could sit around, sc scour the entire internet looking for uh, links on websites, but the fact of the matter is links on websites are usually to IT savvy professionals. Um, it's not always the case, but if somebody has a website, there's a good chance that they have a basic technical background to keep themselves from getting a virus. Uh, no. And, and, and what is someone more likely to trust? A random email from someone that they don't know? Or an email that's supposedly coming from you, uh, that, and, you and they look, it looks like you are sending them a message? Who are they more likely to trust? They're more likely to trust you, and that's why, again, that emotional factor comes into play, and that's why people are tend to open these messages. Because, hey, it's my friend. My friend sent me an email. It's got to be legitimate. Again, they're playing on that theory. I mean, to them, it's a game. I mean, their entire aspect behind it is to get into your head, figure out how can we make them trust this contact. Because it's, I mean, if your friend isn't prone to sending you a link about happy kittens, please don't open the link. I mean, if it just seems like it's off or it's too good to be true, uh, the big one going around is $100 MacBook. Um, the MacBook costs between $1,000 and $2,000. Anyone saying that it costs $1,000, please don't open the link. I mean, just in 90 Nine percent of cases of phishing or virus infections via email, uh, there's a certain common sense aspect that goes into it. Don't trust something just because it's from a friend. I mean, look at the content of it, call them up if it's something that looks fishy, or just delete it. I mean, if it's literally about happy kittens and you don't need to see that link about happy kittens, I, I personally could do without it. Uh, my uncle sends me about a thousand emails a week, which I've now created a smart folder to just isolate him. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the trash can, right? Yeah, yeah. Instant redirect. Um, I did that for a while. He got angry at me. Um, but he sends me these redirects, these links from his friends that are doing the same thing to him. And the reality, I run this stuff through a virus scanner, about 5% of them contain viruses. And this is after they go through the spam filtering and everything else. And it's a little scary because now I have to go to his house and fix his computer because I know he's infected. Then I have to go to all of his friends' houses and fix all their PCs because they're infected. And, you know, it's a big runaround. And I'm just like, just stop sending them. What, what's the issue with you guys? And they're like, oh, we like seeing the silly videos on YouTube. I'm like, okay, then do a search on YouTube. Uh, it's, it's just a little difficult. So if, if, some, if, if you get a, a piece of email from someone that you're not expecting a message from about something, about a link or something they were supposed to send you, the easiest way to get around this problem, call or text the person. Ask them, was this something that you meant to send me? If they say it's not or if they say they, they truly didn't send it, you automatically know that it's a virus that's sent it on their behalf. So that's, that's what I tell people. Just ask the person. Ask them if they, were, if they sent you something. Is it only if you go on a link, or are you open a download or attachments as well? Yes, attachments. But still, the, the, the these virus just, writers don't do attachments as much as they used to because attachments are so heavily filtered now. If you just read the email, you're okay without mm -hmm. doing anything. No. Or Even that's becoming really dangerous really. Uh, now because there wouldn't be pictures that they put into the email, and a lot of times you see that now pictures are automatically blocked. It's because as soon as you download that picture, sometimes that could redirect to a 
uh, elite drug There's items. something called a TIP exploit where they actually embed a little piece of code into one of the pixels on an image. Yes, the one individual pixel, something that your eye can't even discern. It might just show up as a little blue dot somewhere on the image. Once that loads on your PC, your entire PC is infected. If I'm I mean, just reading the text. <laughs> no, just looking at the picture. Uh, reading the text? Yeah, um, just the emails contain HTML code now. I mean, just reading the text can technically get you infected. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I, I know, it's a little overwhelming, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, most of this gets picked up. Um, there's um, a couple of things that I'm going to recommend to you guys just to keep yourselves from getting these viruses. And in addition, we're going to try to protect you guys. Um, one of the other types of viruses uh, I want to go over really quickly is uh, Trojan horse. Uh, and this is the one that uh, you probably uh, ran into um, if it was indeed a legitimate program. Uh, what hackers will do is they'll grab the original downloader and installer for a given file, and then they will inject a uh, virus into that application. And as with Troy, um, you now have something that looks like a friendly gift or an application you intend to install that actually contains a virus or a whole bunch of truth. But um, in this case, um, it's like for an example, uh, says you download a installer for a screensaver. You get your screensaver installed, or your little set of interesting mouse cursors, and then what will come with it is a virus that takes over your entire computer. Um, I had a customer a couple of years back that insisted on having these cool flashy pointers and different screen savers and she'd keep downloading them and I asked her to stop because I mean that's probably gets you these simple little add-ons to your system. Uh, and if you don't need a glittering trail behind your cursor, I'd say avoid it because um, I see that as probably being the number one uh, source for Trojan horse viruses. Um, what we ended up having to do with her is eventually moving her to a uh, Mac PC so she couldn't install these programs. Um, but uh, there was no way to, she you know, she refused to listen to me. Like there was no way. I mean, once you download it, there's no way to take. Clean there the are ways if you have a good antivirus program installed. It's just the prevalence in which she would go into these files like on a daily basis. She was knowingly going into the lines yeah. then on a consistent basis and you're bound to get bit at some point. I mean, that's that's really what happened in that situation. I mean, I, I, was, I was coming out on like a monthly basis and she was getting upset at me and I explained to her why she was getting it, but she wouldn't listen to me. So I'm like, well, it must be your PC. Let's get you on Mac. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't, um, I heard from her the first time in two years uh, this last month. Uh, she wants me to come out and teach her how to use a video editing program. So, I mean, the fact of the matter is, um, I mean, Derek and I both do use PCs. I also have several Macs. Um, the concept that Macs are secure, um, it's a fallacy, but they are targeted less. So if you want to go that route, that is an option. Uh, there, there are antivirus programs for Mac as well, which just gives you that added benefit. But um, that's a Trojan horse. The other one is a rootkit, and what this does is... These are the most popular yeah. forms of infection today. These are also the toughest ones that we, we come across. Um, that video that uh, they showed at the end where they were accessing that woman's computer, um, that was a separate virus from the worm that was infecting the other PCs. They just did that as an example. What a rootkit does is it tries to gain administrative access to your system. And what it'll do is it'll install, it'll get you to install a link to a website or something that'll inject itself into your systems. Um, for example, your um, registry on your PC, sort of a list of all the services that are run at a given time and or how the operating system is intended to work. And what it'll do is it'll inject itself so that every single time your computer shows up, there's a backdoor into your system. And what a given hacker can do is send a set of instructions to the um, to the rootkit to uh, automate an attack, uh, attack a given government structure, um, or to um, spread itself. So these viruses have administrative access. They have access to the internet. They can be updated, and they're probably the scariest because the hacker on the other end can record all your keystrokes see exactly what you're doing on your computer if they decide to log into your computer at a given time 
and they can also set up uh, instances where if a given URL shows up in your browser, they can start tracking you from that point forward. So when you're browsing through uh, your grocery list on Jewel, trying to plan out your trip, they could care less about that. But the second you go to check out on Amazon, they'll start recording all the results on your page. Now, once again, we're not telling you this to scare you. Uh, we're telling you this just so that you're informed as to what's out there. And once again, we are going to give you guys a few solutions to protect yourselves. Um, I just want you guys to have a full, well-rounded example of what these uh, things can do. Uh, common sources of viruses. Um, there's several. Um, of course, we went over email. The other one, um, physically adding storage devices to your PC. Uh, your friend gives you a USB stick, you plug it in your computer, your computer's infected. Um, your friend might not give you an infected USB stick, that is a definitive possibility, probably more likely than not. But in the case that they do, that virus, once you open the file that's infected, or it can actually be in the partition table for your individual USB. So the second you pop it in, you're infected. That's the end of it. The, the, uh, what's the big thing that we heard in the news recently? Stuxnet, the, the attack on the Iranian um, nuclear facilities? That was passed by flash drive. A secret agent went in and actually plugged in an infected flash disk into computers within their facilities, and that's how the broadcast uh, started from those machines. I mean, that. All it, I mean, it's really difficult because, I mean, I, in most cases, people don't intend to spread files by uh, flash drive. I mean, you want to send a homework file from your travels PC to you know, your main computer with the printer on it, and next thing you know, you now have two infected PCs, and it's just a scary aspect of it, but that is one way that viruses can spread. And the other one, if a virus is stored in a CD-ROM, the CD-ROM is no longer writable, even if you have an AV program. Um, the AV program might pick it up and get rid of it, but it stays on that CD. Because a CD can't be written to again by the computer. So if uh, you put a CD in and you have your antivirus says that it's infected, or it's a burnt CD, or you got it from someplace else, throw it away. Um, and it's not worth it. Um, it's not worth putting into another computer by mistake or having it affect something else. Then that was a big problem in the early 2000s when the Napster revolution started. Kids were sharing music files with one another. Uh, but then again, the hackers came along, they started inserting viruses into the music files, and the kids were burning all these disks and giving them to each other. So I saw a lot of burned CDs that had viruses built right in because of uh, things like music files that had uh, infections uh, the, like that. The really interesting one was uh, there was a virus that was put out that um, you put the CD-ROM into the drive. The drive would start reading the CD-ROM, and before it even got to the computer, it would infect the uh, firmware or the actual like instruction set for your DVD burner so that every time you burnt another CD, it would add the virus to the disk. Now that one was a little uh, messed up. It didn't really spread very far, but there were several documented cases of it. It's just really insane what some of these guys can do. Um, another source of uh, viruses are infected websites. Um, as you can see, almost every case in which um, these individual links showed up in emails on Facebook. Um, if you see a link to an external site, um, don't go to it. Unless it's like um, foxnews.com, cnn.com, bbc.com. Those are safe sources. If it's uh, worldglobalnewsplus.com, don't go to it. I mean, there's really no reason. It's, not, it's clearly not a legitimate established news source. Might be a good article, but um, I mean, do some research before you go to an individual site. And the really interesting thing, um, if you want to be sure as to whether or not a site is safe, just go to their homepage. If the homepage doesn't come up and there's a link to an individual news article, it's probably not a safe site. Um, what a lot of hackers will do um, is, especially on Facebook, uh, they'll buy web hosting space, put an individual file on the web and then it'll come up as some other site where you can clearly see that the URL is wrong. Everything about that link just does not look right. Just ignore them, delete the message, that's it. Like I said, most of these viruses, um, they can easily be overcome by common sense. I mean, just be smart when you're browsing the web. Keep an eye to this kind of thing and realize that there are people out there that want to get your information. Um, one of the other things, um, let me get back to email in a little more detail.
detail later. Uh, the other one is infected downloads. Um, if you download a, um, a file, it might contain a Trojan virus, which will then go ahead and infect your PC. Um, we've gone over that one extensively. I'm not going to melt that point anymore. Uh, the next one is uh, P2P software, torrents, and file sharing. Um, for example, How, houses that have a lot of teenagers. This is our biggest issue these days with viruses. Yeah. Teenagers um, are on these networks all the time. Here's a word of advice. If you received a cease and desist letter from Comcast and you have kids, um, I highly advise that you go talk to them because they're probably engaging in torrent downloads. Um, what this is, is you download an entire movie off the internet all at once in one individual file or in multiple files and you bring them all together. Um, and this is a really, really easy way to get viruses. Um, and you're getting about, uh, it's about 10% of the files on these sites are fake. Um, and I mean, while they do have communities built around them that sometimes review them, there's only so much you can do. If a new virus comes out on one of these sites, it's not going to be detected for months because I mean, the antivirus programs don't take spy, uh, this file sharing seriously. I mean, why should they? I mean, there's going to be so many different variants popping up and it's really hard to keep track and they're in isolated little areas. These ones on the file sharing sites aren't usually designed to spread through conventional means. It's designed to spread via this network. They're not going to affect other PCs on your individual network, but they will infect your given PC. And if you continue to share that file with other people, it'll then affect other PCs that download it from you. And that's how that spreads. It's more of an original type virus type uh, thing. Uh, some spyware too, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah, so when, when we work with homes, especially I said teenagers there, because they are the biggest culprits in this, they always want to get stuff for free, free music, free movies. Fine, you might get away eight times out of ten, but those other two times, you're going to get hit with a virus. There are, you can download albums, and I've seen all this, albums and two of the songs are infected with a virus, and they say, hey, the music sounds great, there's no infection here, but it's the final track in, uh, from the album that actually has the virus in it. So as soon as they start listening to it, there goes their system. So I've seen that before. Mu uh, movies will come with, you know, they'll put the movie in there, then they'll say, hey, trailer from the sequel, check this out. That's the actual virus infection right there. All these kinds of things. There's nothing, uh, there's, there's no such thing as getting free music, free movies from sources like that. You are at very, very high risk when you are browsing those kind of networks. Um, the uh, last one is over a network. Um, if you have a network set up at work, and you open an email that has a virus on it and it decides to infect your entire network, and your boss finds out it was you, um, you're probably going to be wanting to grab a cardboard box very quickly. Um, now the issue with this is um, these large companies, they set up these vast networks, and nowadays they sort of have more security on them. But if it's a newer virus that hasn't been documented yet that comes into your company, it could infect upwards of 300 to 1,000 computers in the course of a day. Um, it's a little terrifying to really think about, but the thing is, these viruses, they might target an individual group of systems. And because they are targeting so many PCs at one time, the antivirus software programs usually pick up on it pretty quickly. Uh, they'll start sending usage logs and stuff to the individual companies that sell the software to protect your PCs. And they usually get on top of it pretty quick. And uh, in many cases, Microsoft will actually release a patch for these uh, type of things. Um, Microsoft has made changes to their uh, Windows software in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, they've had plenty of time to uh, make these changes. So um, the uh, cases of network transferred viruses are much lower because, um, once again, this does depend on the way that you set up your network. Uh, you usually need a password to get into someone else's computer. Uh, there might be a global shared directory, but that's usually getting scanned by some sort of uh, antivirus software via the network. All right, uh, what is spyware? All right, I'm gonna go over this pretty quickly. Uh, spyware is nothing more than a software program designed to spy on you. Uh, what it'll do is it'll install on your PC, just as you saw in the video, and it'll keep track of your activities and send it to a remote source. This sort of, um, in the case with the Iranian nuclear plant um, type thing, uh, where they were just trying to keep track of everything that they were doing via their computers, keep track of their information. 
Uh, the other one is uh, Adware. Uh, how many of you have seen pop-ups on your computer? Show of hands. <laughs> All right. um, with um, Adware, uh, what this does is it'll install a program that constantly pops up every 15 minutes and tells you to buy something. Um, interestingly enough, in many cases, this software is legal. Um, I've done some extensive research to uh, discern the difference between adware and ma malware. Uh, in the case of adware, um, I mean, if you agree to install this software, you have to watch these installers. On the bottom, it'll say install such and such program. Make sure to uncheck that because otherwise, like for example, a lot of these coupon websites um, have these individual printers. Here's the thing. You don't need to install any additional software to get a coupon off the internet. Uh, any website that suggests you do probably isn't doing their uh, due diligence to protect you. Um, if you need a good coupon site, retailmenot.com is a good one. It's the one I know me and Derek use a lot for just about everything. They also have an iPhone app. So um, you can actually print out your coupon uh, on your Android phone or your iPhone over a wireless printer. So um, it doesn't really get much simpler than that. Re Retailmenot.com. Well, just okay. now, all one word. Yeah. yeah, I've used it too. Yeah. Great website, they pretty much put together all the different coupons that are out on the web, people submit them, and people actually vote on them. So you know exactly what coupons are valid and what coupons are not valid. Very trusted website, very highly rated. Yeah. So if you're looking for discounts on online shopping, even for uh, brick and mortar stores, they have coupons for that too. Retailmenot.com is a great, great place. Um, I'm trying to think what the other one I used was. Um, what's that one that sh tells you the uh, daily deals for a given area? Is you talking about coupon? No. <sighs> Um, I'll think of it. I'll make sure to hand it off to Ruth to add to the uh, site. I have to check my bookmarks. Um, but what that one does, and I'll make sure to put it up so that you guys can all check it. Um, what it does is it shows you a list of all the best deals, like just ridiculous deals, like 90% off at Kohl's or get a free Slurpee on a given date uh, type thing. And it really is like this really nice bargain site. Um, is it sure. social? No, it's not looking so like it's, it's slightly yeah. more crude than that. Okay. All right. it <laughs> it's almost like a forum post, but it really is a trusted source. Okay. Um, the last one is malware. Okay, all malware is illegal, uh, for starters. In almost every case, malware is illegal because it has a malicious intent. The intent is to either steal your information, uh, break in your system, cause damage uh, in many cases. Um, the reality of it is malware, spyware, and adware all slow down your computer. You don't want any of them. Um, because what they do is they take up RAM, they take up processing power, and they slow your computer way Like down. the Caterpillar, very, very slow. Yeah, slower than yeah essentially. <laughs> um, the reality of it is if you have these software programs installed on your computer, like if you have a computer that you feel is running really slow right now, you probably have one of these programs installed more often than not. Um, now what we do, malware it acts very similar to the other two, as spyware and um, adware, but uh, the reality of it is, like I said, this is malicious. It intends to do you harm and steal your personal information. That is the discerning difference. The other thing is, it tries to hide itself. Uh, it might not show up. Some of them do show themselves. Some of them try to exploit money from you. Others just sit on your computer and hide. Um, it really depends on how they're coded. Um, these three categories of um, software that we brought up are sort of uh, just a general category heading for all these different types of software. It's just a way of classifying them. Um, each one is up to the virus creator as to what this software actually does. And, and as Wes said, in terms of when that buy, when that piece of malware will become active, some of them utilize a, a functionality called acting as a time bomb. So what that means is you might pick up this piece of malware, say, Christmas time, but then 4th of July comes around and it pops up because it's targeting, you know, purchasing, you know, American um, apparel or some kind of, you know, thing related to uh, Independence Day. So again, they sometimes target themselves to come up 
at a very opportune time. You know, you're going to think, you know, it's Easter holiday, oh, terrific time to purchase this item that it pops up on you, when in reality, it's pulling your credit card number, sending it off to China, and they're going to wipe away, you know, that, that credit limit in about 15 minutes. So, yeah. again, be mindful of that. A lot of people ask me, well, uh, I didn't do anything on the computer in the last three days. How did I pick this up? And I tell them, you might have picked it up a week ago, a month ago, three months ago. It's hard to say. It really is hard to say sometimes because a lot of them do include these functions where they're not meant to run right away. They're meant to sit, let you think you're okay, and then come out of the blue and, and start working um, like that configure worm in that video that we saw earlier that started doing its damage uh, after later, at a later date. Let me give you guys an idea of exactly how one of these credit card theft programs work out. Um, envision it this way. Hacker gets your credit card information. Now, your individual credit card isn't going to be worth much money for very long because you, they're going to find out about it very quickly. What a hacker will do, because this program is installed on thousands upon thousands of PCs, is they will collect all your credit card information, go into a hacker-only chat room, and sell your entire identity for 10 cents. Because the reality for them, yes, 10 cents. Your entire personal information, your entire credit card history will be sold for 10 cents. Because the reality of it is they can get so many of these credit cards at one given time that your individual identity is not important to them. It's that 10 cents upon the thousand. It's about margins for them. When and the FBI picks up these criminals, a lot of times when they find these people is they interact with them on these hacker websites, these forums where they're exchanging lists and lists of information, credit card numbers from 4,000 people in Niles or the Chicago area, and they're selling and, and trading and bartering these different things amongst one another. That's what these criminals uh, tend to do these days. And the other thing that you have to realize is a lot of these hackers are very young. I mean, uh, I mean making $10,000 a day is a lot of money to them. And, you know, you steal a million identities, you pay 10 cents on, you know, on the dollar for them, you make 10,000 bucks. And that's the reality of it. It just comes down to raw economics. Um, you have a large commodity that's very easy to get. It's not worth a lot. And you have to get more of them. Which is why these virus attacks become you know, such a big deal. Uh, one example of malware. Uh, how many of you have seen this screen? Or yeah. similar to it. Yeah. A, lot a lot of variants of um, things like this. This is called Antivirus 2012. I've seen it labeled Win7, WinXP, WinVista. And what it does is it's actually designed an interface with your Windows uh, GUI. And it detects the copy of Windows you have. Um, the actual interface will adapt based on your operating system to look like it's part of Windows. If you have a given theme that's in orange, this will show up in orange. It's a very scary program. And, and, the, and the common trend, also one of the nastier ones that are doing these days, some of them are deleting files on people, some of them are hiding all of your, your desktop shortcuts. I got a few of these calls in the last few weeks. Um, they said, hey, this program's on my screen. I can't access anything except my internet icon. Uh, what's going on? What's with this antivirus program? And I tell them it's not. It's a fake program. It's trying to get you into purchasing a fake product to get your credit card again so they can sell it and do whatever they like to do with it. Now, what this will do is it'll pop up telling you that you have like a thousand viruses on your PC. And the reality of it is there's almost no way to get a thousand viruses on your PC at one time. Don't believe any program that says that you have more than, say, 20 viruses. And I think that that's even high. Um, usually, if you have a good antivirus software installed, it'll come up one at a time. If you do have a lot of them, um, it's not going to come up in this large, crazy list like they're showing here with all these different colors and just these crazy names. So they're saying us. all of those are infected. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they're claiming. It's not true. And they're really good because it's going to make your little hard drive activity line in your computer start to go crazy. So you think it's actually a real program doing it, but it's just a program tricking the computer. Uh, what they also will show, what I've seen the last few months, uh, they'll show your, they'll show errors about your hard disk inside your computer. Your hard disk is about to die. Um, purchase program now to save your computer. All these very outlandish statements, outlandish claims about your machine. Um, and again, it, 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 is it is it too good to be true? I mean, is your computer been working okay? If somebody comes up out of the blue and says something like that, you have to you know take a second thought. Is this really the case? What's bad about this is this will show up 
when you go to purchase antivirus protection. From this antivirus isn't a book. yeah. This isn't a real antivirus. Uh, I know. What probably happened was your friend went to a fake antivirus. Well, this is one that I got trying to get a, a, a antivirus program. Yeah, you probably, you probably, you probably, you probably went to Google and you got a link that was going to a illegitimate well, website. I forget exactly what I did, but I, my brother's uh, he's got a degree in computer mm -hmm. science technologies. I went and did what he said on whatever website it was. And I got to see on there. Well, could have been that he said, go to click on this link on Google. That could have been a bad link. Yeah. Uh, and if, you, if you're going to do something like that, you want to go directly to the vendor's site by typing in the vendor's site with, with, in your internet browser. Okay. If you're purchasing a NOT32, which is our recommended program, you're going to go to ESET.com. You're not going to go to Google and you're, gonna type, you're not going to type in, you know, purchase NOT32 um, for cheap. That's when you tend to get. Right. You know these infected websites because these people are preying on your intention of getting a discount, getting something for nothing. Yeah. Again, playing on your emotion. That's how they do it. I mean, here's the reality of it. I'm an IT professional. I work on PCs every single day. I get, I have, a, I have the antivirus that we're going to go over in a minute. But it pops up once a month telling me that something tried to infect my system, and this is coming from my aspect. I can only imagine. Now, how much easier it is for the average user to get these viruses. I and mean, it's really important to have the right protection and security. Yes? I had a terrible experience, and it shows you that why I'm taking this class, mm -hmm. but I got a phone call from somebody identifying themselves as a Microsoft uh, professional no. technician. Yeah. When did this told happen? me this Three was weeks. about two three weeks ago. Told me to go turn on my computer, go on the internet, write down this serial number, mm -hmm. big long thing. Sure. Then goes me through a button bunch of things, and then shows me a bunch of numbers. Is that number? <laughs> that you have, that they told me to write down one of those, yes, I think it's your you have a lot of viruses, showed me a whole list of these viruses, yeah, and that, that was nothing, what he went through. Um, because, and then uh, finally he says, uh, you know, do you have a, a somebody servicing, that you should always have a Microsoft professional, and then they finally got to... That's of selling me something. I said, uh, something about anti, we can fix it right from here. I said, how much is it going to cost? And then they said, depends on what, what program you're going to buy. And they put on three different ones going from $40 to about $199. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I said, I'm not giving you my credit card. Good. No, it goes to some other website, secure website, blah, 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 blah. And they kept pressing me, and I was having a bad day, so I was falling for all of this, and my husband was, was not home. So finally I said, I can't do anything until I talk to my husband. Well, with that, all this stuff starts disappearing, this arrow was flying, and I'm going, right, I said, um, oh my God, what's happening to my computer? And um, I, I, I shut it off. All right, have you turned it on again? I turned it on again, and everything was okay, but... From what you're saying here, maybe it's not okay anymore. Um, um, realistically, don't use that computer until somebody looks at it. Um, do not turn that computer back on. Even for enough, no, not the internet? Don't nothing? use it for anyone. Somebody has full access to your system. As um, soon as you clicked on that, whatever he gave you, that serial number, which actually probably was just his gateway. Of no, I didn't have to click machine. on it. He just said to look at... Is that number that he gave me on this? Well, you said all this stuff started happening on your screen. That doesn't happen on its own, though. No. Somebody but I thought maybe things. it was after, after talking to my husband when he came home about this. All of these things were disappearing, and he thought maybe that it wasn't on my computer at all, but it no, was it, there. It was. Something that they set up. So this is something that we should have made a slide for. This is becoming increasingly common. Out of the blue phone calls telling you, we noticed that your computer has viruses. Well, by gosh, how do you know my computer has viruses? You have to ask yourself, again, the first right. point of, you know, what's going on here? Okay. These people will never give you a legitimate phone number. They will never tell you who they work for. They will never tell you a proper callback telephone that you can reach them at. It's all right. on the spot making you, you know, think that, that your computer has some kind of infections. They're playing on emotion. They're social engineering uh, their way into your computer. This is social engineering at its hardest. 
uh, literally calling you up in person and pretending to be someone else. That is like the most raw form of social engineering. And it's literally like calling up some, to a corporation and saying, what's the number on your modem? I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. And it's just But this number, that, I checked you know. my modem. It's not the number on my modem. No, it's the number for your IP. I, I can almost guarantee you the number that he asked for was your IP address. And it like, gave him access to your I guess I still All it was was a service act. I he still, was playing I still a lot of bells and that. whistles on the screen, making you believe something truly was up. All it was was a pre-recorded kind of uh, program that goes ahead and you go into it, probably gave you access to your machine, but also uh, put the slideshow up, showing you these different programs. If you clicked on a website, it would go to some you know illegitimate website. They would take the credit card number. They say, "Hey, are you seeing the address of blah blah blah?" Of course, he's going to tell you the address because he's the one that's you know working for the illegitimate person that's yeah. doing this kind of mm -hmm. scheme. The so. reality of it is, there's a really good chance he can see everything when you're on a computer. I mean, no joke. But what I will say, Microsoft, none of the big companies, computer companies, will ever call you out of the blue saying anything like that. And never believe it. Here's the thing. In 99% of cases, unless you're a corporate user of Windows, you can't even call Microsoft. They don't even have a tech support line. Um, I have tried getting a hold of Microsoft in like several cases. They ask them individual questions. There's no number. You have to submit support tickets for everything with Microsoft. So when you start getting calls from a Microsoft representative, it's fake. They're, they don't have a support system like that at all. Even if you Especially want one that... I guesses know. out these machines have viruses on them. So again, just think about, you know, before you, you get tricked into someone, you know, giving a credit card number to someone like that, you know, think, you know, did I have any virus, you know, should some, is someone supposed to be calling me about something like this? Did I reach out to someone about this? I mean, yes, if you reach out to our company, yes, we'll call you back and talk to you about, you know, whatever issue you have. But Microsoft, Symantec, these big companies, they will not call you out of the blue. All right, um, one good solution, and if your computer is already infected, this might not work, but uh, this will usually prevent you from getting an infection. So this is a preventive measure, and I recommend that every single person in this room who has a Windows PC or Mac, they have a version for Macintosh also, get this program. It's called ESET Nod32. It is the industry-leading best antivirus that we've found, and we've done extensive comparisons against all of them. Um, who here has Norton or McAfee on your PC? All right, uninstall it. it. All it's doing is slowing down your computer. Um, I had Norton several years back, and I've discovered that what Norton is really good at doing is telling you if you have a virus and then doing nothing about it. No, they tell you to buy more. Oh, really? Yeah, I had one, right. one, one, one computer. And it, it got a virus, it went right around Norton, shut down Norton, and said, you need to buy more spyware from mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, Norton has, in its heyday, back in the 90s, was the best antivirus software out there. It was fast, speedy, and did a good job. Uh, since about 2000, it has just bogged itself down. Um, if you have an older computer, I mean, if you have a Pentium 2, Pentium 3, Pentium 4, Core 2, and even my quad core, like if I install Norton on it, I've seen customers with quad cores that get slowed down by Norton because what it does is it uses all your RAM and it uses all your CPU power just like these viruses do, but it's trying to use it for a good purpose, but their engine is so poorly written and they have so many viruses. They're going to check your computer for viruses from the 90s, and there's no reason for it. Go ahead. Well, it is exactly what's happening, and it is an old computer, and it is really slow, and now we keep getting these messages, like, I can't remember the exact word, but it's something like, you know, something's being used to capacity. Yeah, you um, yeah. your computer's being filled up by your antivirus, yeah. and there's no reason for that. Um, this program is the best. It is fast. It uses maybe 32 megabytes of memory in your system at any given time, and it sets itself to low priority. So if you're doing something else on your computer while it's running a scan or checking files on your flash drive, it will not hinder your use of the computer. There's no reason that the antivirus should deem itself more important than your web browser or Microsoft Word or any other user program that's trying to run on your system because your intent is to use the computer, not have it scanned for viruses while you're trying to run out the door printing something because you're running late for a meeting. So less, less would it be to put this on first and then uninstall a Norton or? 
Um, uninstall Norton first. It'll actually give you a warning if you try to install this uh, before uh, uninstalling Norton. So the whole Norton program take off? And yeah, take, uh, get rid of Norton, get rid of McAfee, get rid of malware bytes, any other spyware, or anything else you have on your system related to system security. Get rid of that and then install your set. It costs $40 for a year. If you buy a two year, it costs uh, $7.99. Uh, we put up a link there. Uh, if you go to that link, uh, they give you that $40 price um, with the 25% uh, discount that they're giving out. Is the only way to get that off the internet? Yes. Uh, there are CDs that you can purchase from them, but they cost $20 more. Downloading it from it's their worth web. worth it! <laughs> here's the thing. Um, they're so secure. I can guarantee you that if you go to that link that we sent you, you'll go to a secure site. Um, and it is on our uh, handouts, so if you picked it up today, uh, you do have a copy of that link on there. Um, or you can download it from our site um, at firelogic.net, and it's located right here. Here's the Windows version, and then there's the Mac version. How about Microsoft Essentials? Um, get rid of it. Get rid of it? Yeah, it's garbage. Get rid of it. Yeah. It's made by Microsoft. It's designed to detect it, but their engine's slow. It's, it's not a horrible program. I mean, we recommend it to people that don't want to use the free antiviruses or not, and I mean, it works for some people. I, I personally don't think it's secure enough. Um, one other thing I want to go over very quickly, Facebook safety. Uh, who here has a Facebook account? Okay. Um, the reality of it is uh, don't friend people that you don't know. Um, never open up links that seem uh, to be fake. So like we showed you in the previous video, if you go to somebody's Facebook account and they send you a link to something that just seems wacky or uh, totally impossible, don't click on it, delete the message or call them. Uh, same thing as the website. Um, don't add your phone number to your Facebook page. A lot of people add their phone number, their address, their place of work, all this contact information. If you don't want someone else to know it, don't put it on the internet. Um, the other thing, um, don't post when you're going on vacation onto your Facebook page. I'm going to Bermuda for the next two weeks. I'm leaving on this date. Um, great. Now anyone that you know in your network or who has friended you at any point now knows that your house will be empty. Yes. Um, not a good thing. Um, the other thing, set yes. Your yes, Wes, question. Go ahead. Well, um, one of the kids, you know, they have a, they have a new granddaughter. And so he said, I said, how's your Facebook going? He says, well, I only friend the people that, like, my screening thing is, I only friend people who I want to be able to see a picture of my daughter. Okay. But then, like, the picture's not secure anyway. Said, well, that's true, but technically speaking, that's the last thing. Set your profile up private. Uh, that limits it so that only people that are on your friends list can see your uh, individual profile. And on top of that, you can lock it down so that only individual friends can see certain components of your site. So you can literally just bring it down. So then if you have it on private and only certain people can see it, Google then won't index it. Can, they, can the friend then pass that information on or open yes. it up? Technically, if they right click on the image and save the URL for it, they can pass it on. That is a discernible risk. Uh, that's why we say if there's a picture that you don't want somebody to see, or I mean, it, don't put it online. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. In most cases, I mean, it's going to be a rare exception for someone in your friend group that you trust, that you've given permission to this file, to copy and put some files. And if anything, ask them not to. Mm -hmm. I mean, and usually, I mean, who would have access to something like that? For family members, grandma. I don't know why grandma would have a Facebook, but I might. Uh, yes, she does. <laughs> I know. There, there are. It, it's interesting. <laughs> Um, I know it's not the world in the 90s at all. Um, uh, staying safe with email. I'm going to go over email security again really quickly. Um, no legitimate company will ever ask for your personal credentials in an email. If somebody asks you for your password in an email, uh, report them as spam immediately to whichever search engine you have. Most email programs have this little spam button. The other one, if, uh, Information such as credit cards, social security numbers, and passwords. So none of that. Don't ever give that to anyone via email, uh, unless you're submitting tax forms on TurboTax. That's a whole other thing. Um, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Like I said, $100 MacBooks do not happen. 
Uh, unless you're on quick bits, but that's a whole other thing, and you aren't going to win that anyway. Um, there's, uh, let's see, freebies, I'm not ever get. Most of that's spam, so you don't want to read those anyway. Most people have learned to mentally filter them out. Find another button here. Hi, what does perishing look like? On this, fishing. fishing. Fishing, thank you. Um, Fishing essentially is what its name implies. You're throwing a line out there and trying to catch something. And what these hackers will do is they'll try to fish for your information. And um, they'll send links and emails, uh, check messages for bad grammar, if it's from a, what you believe to be a legitimate source, if every other word is spelled wrong or it sounds like the person sending it isn't very good in the written language. Uh, it probably is coming from a uh, country like, say, China, or um, there's a lot of uh, hacks coming out of Africa now. Um, a lot of third world countries are just getting these sort of hacks, not that China's a third world country. But, um, the other one, um, if, uh, if there's any sort of threat against your account, where they say um, you're going to lose access to your account, uh, your passwords are going to change, don't believe that. Um, if your password's going to change, it's going to pop up as soon as you log into your email asking you to change your password. Uh, that's legitimate. Um, if it's in an email address asking you to send your password so that you can submit a change and to send your new password, they now have your old password and your potential new password that you can now try on all your other accounts. Don't ever send any sort of password information via a physical email. This 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 uh, this is a really good blueprint, and this is what I use when people call me and ask, "Is this real email, or is this a, a fake email that someone that a company sent me?" So all these aspects that are shown here are the most common things I always see in these messages. One thing that wasn't covered here: logos. These goofballs that send these messages out, they'll put the Microsoft logo or the Facebook logo, but it doesn't look right. It's been scrunched this way, or it's been scrunched this way. So that's your first clue. <coughs> Spelling, almost always. These hackers, these crackers from other countries, they can't spell properly, so they're like this. Below is two L's. Again, if the spelling's not accurate, the real company didn't send it out. The links portion here, you'll see a link, but look, when you scroll over with your mouse, look where it goes to. It's not going to this website. It's going to this website. That's not legitimate. That's a, that, that is that is going to a fake web page that's going to ask for to put information in that you shouldn't be giving away. So these different things, when you add all these things up, this equates to an email that uh, is actually just a phishing attack. And this is always great. They always put threats on. We're going to shut down your bank account. You will not be able to use your debit card. Your Facebook's going to go away. Your email is going to stop working. All these things that, again, make it too, sound too good to be true, things that are playing on your emotions. So look for these different kinds of things and messages. So if you're questioning yourself, is this legitimate, is it not, does it meet these different uh, part, uh, pieces of criteria? Let me go over one th last thing really quick. Um, one last thing I want to explain to you guys um, is um, wireless security. Uh, how many of you have used your laptops in a cafe or a Starbucks or some sort of restaurant? Mm -hmm. um, there's a few things I want to advise to you guys really quick. Uh, when you are using your laptop in a um, public location, um, let me bring up another Google browser. All right, as you can see up at the top, uh, does anyone see anything particularly odd about the URL that I just typed in for Google? There's no www. Oh, not particularly. You can add... add it got an S. It has an S. S. The S is for uh, security certificate. And what that does is, if you go to https backslash google.com, it'll take you to an encrypted version of Google. So if you're in a cafe, people can't see what you're searching for. Here's a scary aspect of it. There's a program out there called Wireshark. Uh, and this is available for PCs, Macs, Linux, any hacker who wants this program can get it. And what it does is it keeps a full download of all the internet activity in a given location. And this is designed for network security analysis, but can be easily, easily abused at any time. And what they will do is they'll dump all the information from a Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, I was actually following uh, some guy that was doing an attack on a cafe. 
I ended up reporting him. It was about a year ago. We had that big power outage that put up all the power in Park Ridge for like a week. Mm -hmm. This guy was hopping to different Starbucks and different Paneras in the area, and he was just collecting information because no one but these restaurants had power. And he was sitting in the cafe downloading information. And I was catching that he was doing these attacks. I ended up reporting um, his MAC address of his laptop. And I don't know what happened, but abruptly the next day it stopped. Um, How did he spy? Um, realistically, he tried uh, grabbing a cookie off my Facebook page. He logged into my Facebook and tried spam linking me. Um, me personally, I just keep track of that kind of thing. Um, I found out about it. Somebody logged into my Facebook page. I started running Wireshark on my PC. I ended up catching his IP address, scanning other reports, logging into other people's Facebook accounts. Anytime I'd see one PC logging into three or four different Facebook accounts at one time, something was up because it would massively spam out these links that would then get spammed out to all your friends. And he would just keep infecting Facebook pages. It was a little JavaScript. And this is, again, this is not something that we're recommending anyone else to do. This is the, the good hacker in West that was, <laughs> that was being correct. Okay. I mean, yeah, don't go download Wireshark. It's more than most people would need. But what I'm trying to, go ahead. Uh, what I'm trying to suggest to you people, um, when you're doing, don't do credit card information at Panera, please. Um, avoid logging into bank accounts if you're not at home. Um, if you're trying to log into Facebook, there's an HTTPS Facebook, which will give you a secure uh, socket layer for Facebook, um, and that you know that that version safe. All these www. Always make sure that when you're using a social media site or eBay or any of these other sites, that it's HTTPS. And there's a large variety of sites that support this now, um, and it's a good way to know that your information is safe and encrypted. Also, if you use the URL above for Google on your laptop. Um, you know that your uh, computer is going to be safe because no one else is seeing what you're searching for. And it's not to say that your information can't be gotten, it's just it's another barrier to put up against these hackers. Well, um, go ahead. When you, example, go to Panera, you have to go answer a little, learn a little question, then you get down to the website. Yeah. Do you put this HTTPS, whatever you want, after, After. Okay. once you're loaded, and then it'll always be secure, or are you always under the caption of unsecure through Panera? Um, you're logging in through Panera, and then once you're securely logged in, you can secure your own connection. Anyone in that cafe can see what you're doing. Even with this. With this, it prevents them from seeing physically what you're doing. They'll see, still see that you're going to Google, but they won't see what you're doing on that site. So if you go to chase.com with the secure login, they'll see that you went to the Chase site, but they won't know what you were doing there. They won't see your bank account information. They won't see any of that. That's all secure. Um, the last thing I wanted to go over are fake Wi-Fi hotspots. If you go into a Panera Bread or the airport or a Starbucks, and instead of seeing AT&T Wi-Fi or Panera Wi-Fi or some sort of uh, like Zango Wi-Fi hotspot type deal, um, it says free public Wi-Fi, that's an unsecure Wi-Fi hotspot that somebody has set up to try to steal your information. Uh, what they can do is they can actually set up um, fake, even if it's got the ass in it, in these fake hotspots, hot they can do what's called a man in the middle attack and they'll take the fake certificate, deliver it to your PC, and they'll say it's safe, but then pass on the actual certificate to the final company getting your password process, which is kind of scary. Okay, will you protect yourself from this? Um, don't log into fake hotspots. Oh. <laughs> um, That's my only advice. It's really the only thing you can do. Um, if you go to a place and it says uh, Panera 2, and there's a, we're going to get Panera there, um, tell the manager, um, don't log into Panera 2. Uh, it's a big thing. Uh, it will be a Panera, and then there will be a Panera free Wi-Fi. Um, I've seen this actually happen in uh, downtown Chicago. Uh, there was a um, Starbucks uh, that had a Starbucks Wi-Fi ID and one said AT&T uh, free Wi-Fi. Now the AT&T free Wi-Fi was a legitimate one. Uh, Starbucks does not have their own Wi-Fi network. They uh, use the AT&T uh, network for all their uh, Wi-Fi. And it's just... How, how would you know that? I, mean, I would never have known it. It's a good question. Um, I mean, 
if you have a program like if you're if you're curious, here's one good way. You go to a restaurant, they say free wireless, but they don't say on the placard or the window decal what the name of their network is. Ask a manager. The manager will tell you, or one of the staff members of the store will tell you. Yeah. What's your actual wireless network? So if they tell you, you can make sure you're on the proper one. That's really the, that's the simplest way I can see of uh, you know avoiding a situation like this of getting onto these fake um, uh, fake uh, hotspots that they have. Um, then the final thing, uh, who who here is still using Internet Explorer? I hope I don't see anyone from our previous classes. Oh, so oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. What is my advice to you guys, those that have been to our class before? What? Install oh, what? Google yeah. Install Google Chrome. Uh, Dictionary Explorer is an insecure, slow, outdated browser. And Explorer 9 is a little better, but Google Chrome is faster than anything else out there. Google what? Google Chrome. C-H-R-O-M-E. Google.com slash Chrome. Mm. Get you right there. Mac or PC. You can download the version of whatever your PC is. Yeah. And it's, it's also the drive now. Um, that's that's a different component. Uh, okay. yeah, that's for another class. Go ahead. What do you recommend to protect our smartphones from viruses? Um, is it Android or iPhone? I don't know. I've got it yet. I, I, I have a dumb phone. I got uh, iPhone. If your phone isn't hacked, don't worry about it. Um, ironically, uh, Apple. Every security software that goes. I mean, any application that goes into an iPhone has to be uh, given a validity key to be accessible on the system, and that key will not be cracked for about a uh, million years. Uh, it's signed every single time you have an application to the uh, App Store. Um, so as far as Android, it's an open ecosystem. Um, any application can be submitted and uh, viewed and usually passes, and there are a ton of infected programs on the um, Google Play Store. Uh, there's several free antiviruses that do a great job. Um, for, the, for the smartphones. Yeah. That uh, company, that, that NAT32 that we showed, that company that makes that program, they have a version of their software for smartphones. The only, the only thing I'm going to advise with the smartphone so, uh, antivirus is that once you've scanned your phone, you move it. The phones are, yeah. Once you scan your phone with the AV software for the phones, uninstall the program. It's not something that you want constantly running on your uh, phone because they only uh, it's going to kill you with battery life. Oh, okay. Um, and doing an occasional scan every uh, month or two is hugely sufficient. And the next question I have for you is this. Sorry. Um, some of these smartphones have the ability to create their own mobile hotspot. Okay. Like three or five. What do you recommend encrypting or protecting for your computer between your smartphones? WPA2. Huh? WPA2. WPA2. Um, yeah, just put a password on your phone. It'll usually encrypt it in WPA or WPA2, and that way no one else in the area around you can access it. Oh, okay, so you won't have to worry. Go ahead. That'll usually, and that'll just one, one more thing, that'll usually be asked in the form of when you're setting up your mobile hotspot, it'll usually ask you what level of security that you want to set for your password. That's where you're going to see the WPA uh, item that he was talking about. So when you can, WPA2 is your best bet when you're setting that up. For your so okay. allow me to simplify this for you guys. Um, if you want to be secure on the internet, a few things you have to do. Some due diligence as to what you actually open. Use Google Chrome, use Nod32. Those are your best defenses against a virus or a hacker attack. Ruth, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, what about uh, browsers for tablets? Um, most of the tablets are either running Android or iOS. iPad, I say the same thing. Uh, so can you get a Chrome version for the Android tablet then? Um, there is a, well, uh, all the browsers on Android are built upon Chrome. Okay, so um, that would be reasonably safe. Yeah, you can definitely download the actual Chrome browser. There is Chrome for iOS. Um, the thing about it is it is a, just a layer on top of Safari because of the way Apple does its uh, yeah. thing. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I will. Um, <laughs> how effective, you mentioned uh, McAfee and Norton, neither of which we have anymore, but... Um, what about Kaspersky antivirus? Is that any good? Because it's a little pricey. Um, Kaspersky, I would say is from him up there in your presentation. Yes, yes, and, and that's just what I'll say. I'll say Kaspersky is probably just a notch or two below Not32. Okay. Respected program. I don't tell people to uninstall it if they have it or pay for it. Um, 
But I think it's just, like I said, just a step below NOD32. But a good product. So if you have it, don't no need to remove it. I mean, my advice with Kaspersky, if you have it, use it for the license up. It'll probably protect you fine, but then switch to NOD32 because it is a superior product. Go ahead. Um, are there any blatant risks proper to online banking? Um, fake sites. If uh, you, you like say, for example, you log into Chase, make sure it's chase.com, and then it does come up with that S in the corner because that's uh, usually a good indicator that's the actual Chase site. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you don't misspell it, um, and that's pretty much that for online banking. Um, if you have Windows popping up on your computer, trying to take over individual things that are going on with you, um, don't do banking on that PC until you have it looked at. And again, other than going back to email, the biggest problem I see with banking, online banking, is those fake phishing emails that are giving you links saying they're going to Chase, but then you roll your mouse over and you see it's not going to Chase or Bank of America or any other bank websites. That is the, probably the biggest issue that I've seen personally. So never click on a bank website link inside of an email. Go to the actual bank website. Go to Chase.com. Don't let someone else take you there. Type it in yourself. I mean, always make sure you get to the right spot. That's kind of the odd thing because Chase does send me emails about uh, my account. I still think it's safer to go to Chase.com and look at that message. Thank you. And again, if it is legitimate email, I'm not saying they don't send yeah. a legitimate emails, but again, watch for those things. Watch for your spelling, your logos, your threats, what they're asking for. If they don't include those key elements, it's probably a legitimate message and you can use the, the link within there. But just again, due diligence and be mindful of what you're clicking on before you click on it. I, I don't know if it's true or not, but some of my colleagues have told me that a good hacker has uh, uh, some kind of device he can walk by you and get the information off of your credit card. Oh, that's called skimming. That's a whole other thing. Um, if it's true, how do you protect yourself? I'll, t I'll tell you. It's out of the scope of, Derek, do you have your wallet? You, yeah. you mean any card with the RFID tag on it? All right, on here, on the, you actually don't have one. No, yeah, I don't. <laughs> All right, um, if you look on the back of your credit card, it has a little Wi-Fi antenna on it. Um, this is my advice. And if you ever go to McDonald's or any restaurants that have those little scanners that sure so an upside down Wi-Fi logo, um, that those cards are RFID enabled, and somebody can take your entire credit card information from your back pocket. Now, my advice, uh, realistically, I don't do anything about it because I think it's ridiculous. I've seen aluminum wallets sold online that supposedly solve the problem. <laughs> Lead-lined wallets. I don't know why you want to walk around with lead in your pocket. I might as well carry a vial of mercury. Um, and then the other one is, um, and the easiest solution if it really is a concern to you. Um, is to find the little bulge in your card that represents the microchip on your RFID enabled card and drill a hole for it. That is the easiest solution. You can also, all the banks I know for a fact offer the non RFID yeah. versions. Just ask the bank. I don't tell them, I don't want the RFID version that will send you a copy of your card that doesn't have that wireless technology. So what is I personally don't let my bank send me those versions. I don't want to carry those around. An RFID chip in your credit card. Yeah, there's a chip in your credit card. And it's supposed to do what? Allow. No, go ahead. Supposed. To, uh, I have to leave. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm moving. We'll, we'll lock up. And the school. movers are coming. Oh, so oh. there are still some loose things in my home. The door is locked. Had I known Cindy was coming, I would have talked to her before we <laughs> registered. It was later than I would know this stuff. Thank you, so Ruth. So we're, um, we're really grateful that all of you came, and we're so grateful to the gentleman from Fire Logic. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> I, I know for sure you're good until 12. Okay. And if someone else comes yeah. in and says they're using the room, you know you've got to leave. <laughs> yeah, Are there any other questions? I want to make sure that anything oh, is answered. This. I want to understand this chip. Is in, what's the RFID it's chip it's for? It's for it is for to, the card to allow to do those transactions without doing a swipe where you can just tap it onto a device that allows that uh, to be done. So as long as it's drilled or did not... As long as it's drilled or not existed in, in your card, and if you're curious, you can always call your bank up and ask them, hey, is my card RFID enabled? And they'll be able to tell you what characteristics to look for if it has it. If it has it, you don't want it, just tell them send me one without that technology. They will all offer to do that. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Go ahead, do you have a question? A really quick one. Uh, about this, uh, normally you get to pop-outs, uh, up update your download. Yes. 
and yes. uh, the video clips you get on uh, Yahoo. Is this okay. Right? Yeah. Is that what you're yes. talking yeah. about? Yes. Uh, don't yes. roll through yes. that. There's, no. there's a bridge like somewhere in your park. Reuters, BBC, ABC, CBS, and they are trusted like the clips, and they can be watched. Um, They're not going to cause really you useful. Anymore. Just be careful about things you watch on other websites, you know, websites but that... My husband has one in his wallet. And those update messages are... I think it's paranoid. Microsoft Windows will frequently pop those up. Adobe programs will pop those up. Those are legitimate. We do recommend people install that. Grab a coupon from the back, and then we do a 20-minute free call. The agency do ask your okay. details. Okay. Is it this thing? Yeah. yeah. That's it. Okay. It's paranoia. I mean, yeah. realistically, no, if you come up with you behind you with a car, how do they ask you for it? What, what kind of do I say there? Are you done recording? But it's for a website. And it's a website that is probably secure. I have Derek Gus to turn it off. It's not like they're asking you. No, they're not asking you. Okay. And that's fine. That's legitimate. Go ahead. You look for that HTTPS that we were showing you. That means you're in a secure website. It should be fine. I haven't heard of any employer that would use a non-HTTPS web application for you to apply for parental blocking programs. You'd have to do a little more research on it. Uh, there are good parental blocking programs. Um, the best one that I've used in, the, in years past, uh, NetNanny. That's the one I re usually recommend. Um, it's about $35 a year, and you get free updates for the entire year. The reason I like it is because they give you the free updates for the entire time you're subscribed, and also they update the bad websites list for the program, so you don't have to worry about, is this website going to be blocked? Is that one going to be blocked? They're doing that work for you. So NetNanny, best one for Mac and for Windows PCs. What is it? NetNanny, all one it? word. What is it for? It's for parental control. You have youngsters using a computer, you want to block websites, <laughs> schedule times they shouldn't be using internet. That all can be done with the net money. All right, so here's what I'm going to do really quickly, and we do this every class. Um, we have our exclusive Firelogic apparel. Um, we have yet to set up an online store, so this is the only place you can get them. <laughs> Um, I have one tank top and one t-shirt. First person that can tell me the number behind my back uh, gets it. One to five. We're going to have uh, three tank tops. Three. Uh, we're going to do this All right. I have a t-shirt. First person to tell me the number behind my back. Four. Two. One. <laughs> Nobody's guessed it yet. Five. Three. In the back. <laughs> on the back of the agenda, uh, again, I want to thank everyone for coming out, but on the back of the agenda, um, you will notice we put up the future classes that we're having. I hope everyone learned something today. We are doing about two classes a month between here and the Park Ridge Library, so if there's something that you want to learn about, any of these given topics, we're going back to our Google Apps. We're starting back with Gmail. We're going to be doing then um, Google Calendar and then Docs and the Google Sites, so we're going to repeat what we did here uh, towards the beginning of this year. Uh, there's going to be a computer safety class for intermediate level users that want to learn a little bit more about the uh, intricacies of some of the different things that we talked about. Um, and then again, we'll be at the Taste of Park Ridge on July 14th all day, so come out. We're going to have new shirts, new tank tops. We're going to be giving raffling something nice off, so feel free to stop on over and, uh, and visit us there. So if you want some of that free fire logic apparel, feel free to stop by. <laughs> and on the back, the link, we put, I put the link to the antivirus that we recommended. It's on the back of the sheet. I put a few resources to different websites where you can read about uh, the, uh, security information from Microsoft's website. They have a nice uh, portal page for all kinds of things about email security, how to secure your Windows PC, best practices. So that's the link I put on there. Um, the NOD32 program is a free online scanner that you can use. So if you don't want to purchase their program yet, but want to try to remove some viruses that are on your PC, they offer a free online version. And that's the link that I put on there as well. And then I put a link to our uh, company's blog. I'm consistently writing things about uh, how to stay safe online, different security practices. Uh, so you can check out our blog uh, from our company website as well. Okay? And as usual, if you need any help with at your home or office, we're always available. You can grab a card and a flyer that offers you 10% off uh, your first service call. Okay? If anyone has any other questions, I'm going to take the recording off. You can approach Wesley or myself, and you can ask anything one-on-one -on -one if you don't want to ask it to the group, okay? Go ahead. <laughs> Last question? Sure, sure. Let me stop the recording, and we'll, we'll do that one-on-one, -on -one, okay?
Thank you. We are officially all done. If you have anything else you want to ask us about, feel free to stay after. We're here until noon. Thank you, Thank you, everyone.